Hi history lovers and welcome or welcome back to the channel where I bring you new videos every week on all aspects of the past. Today on History Calling we are looking at the biggest diamond ever found and which produced two of the most famous jewels in the British Crown Jewels collection. I'm speaking of course about the famous Cullinan Diamond, mother stone of the Great Star of Africa which is now in the Sovereign Scepter and the Second Star of Africa or Lesser Star of Africa which now adorns the Imperial State Crown. You'll hear the story of how this record-breaking diamond was found, how it made its way into the British royal family, and how it made those charged with handling it literally faint on occasion. Please remember to give this video a like, hit that subscribe button, switch on the notification bell, and select all when you do so. That way you'll never miss one of my uploads. If you check out the description box below, you'll also find a link to my Instagram account, where my username is History Calling, and to some other sources about this incredible stone. The story behind the discovery of the Cullinan varies a little depending on which sources you read. The most common account I've seen is that on the 25th of January 1905, Captain Frederick Wells, surface manager of the Premier Diamond Mine near Pretoria, which was then in the British-controlled region of Transvaal and is now part of South Africa, was walking through the mine when he spotted a flash of light bouncing off what would turn out to be the largest diamond ever discovered by humans. Another version of the story, however, says that it was found on the 26th of January and by an unnamed mine hand who then gave it to Wells to be taken to his superiors. Whatever the truth of the matter, it was extracted from a depth of around 18 feet below the surface and proved to be eight-sided, blue-white and weigh a staggering 3,106 metric carats. It measured 10.1 by 6.35 by 5.9 centimetres or four by two and a half by two inches if you prefer imperial measurements. It dwarfed the other large diamonds in the world, including the famed Koh Noor and the Hope Diamond, both of which are in this image. I also have a video on the Hope Diamond and its supposed curse, which I'll leave linked on screen and below for you. The newly discovered diamond was almost flawless, with only two spots, one on the surface, the other about one centimetre within the stone. A small air pocket within it produced a rainbow effect known as Newton's rings, and, as large as it was, it appeared that it had initially been part of an even larger stone which had been broken up by Mother Nature at some point in the past. The chairman of the mining company at the time was named Thomas Cullinan, and the diamond was quickly named after him. Wells was given $10,000 for having, apparently, discovered it. Initially, the diamond was the joint property of the mining company and the Transvaal government, who had a right to a whopping 60% share in all diamond profits in the country. According to an article published in the Scientific American in 1908, the uncut stone was valued at 1 million US dollars. It was quickly put on display in the Standard Bank in Johannesburg, where 8 to 9,000 people filed past to see it. Then, in April 1905, it was sent to England. The issue of how to transport such a valuable commodity caused some headaches, though, for fear it would be stolen. A story was therefore put out that it was being conveyed on a steamboat under heavy guard. This, however, was a red herring, designed to distract any would-be thieves, and the truth was much more remarkable. The largest diamond ever found was in fact placed in an unmarked box and sent via registered post. In this way, it safely arrived in London at the offices of S. Newman & Company, who were the sales agent for the Premier Mining Company. Precisely where it was kept over the next two years, again, depends on which source you read. But the Times newspaper reported in 1908 that it had been held in a bank vault. The offices of S. Newman & Co. and of the Premier Mining Company are also possibilities. It was shown to prospective buyers and was inspected by, among others, King Edward VII. It was so large, though, that no one knew how it could possibly be cut, and the company found they couldn't sell it. In 1907, the Transvaal government decided to buy out the Premier Company's stake in the stone for £150,000, and make a gift of it to King Edward in recognition of their support of British rule in Transvaal at that time. The diamond was taken under heavy guard to Sandringham House in Norfolk, where it was formally presented to the monarch on his 66th birthday, 
the 9th of November, 1907. That same day, the Secretary of State for the Colonies sent a telegram on the King's behalf to the Transvaal government, which included the lines, as published by the Times two days later, His Majesty accepts for himself and his successors the valuable gift of the Cullinan Diamond, as being, in the words of your ministers, a token of the loyalty and attachment of the people of the Transvaal to his throne and person and he will cause this great and unique diamond to be kept and preserved among the historic jewels which form the heirlooms of the crown. The diamond would indeed join the crown jewels in the Tower of London, however it had yet to be cut and polished. The firm chosen to undertake this task was Ashers of Amsterdam, and on the 23rd of January 1908 it was handed over to their representatives and taken to the Netherlands by boat and train via Calais and Brussels. The stone was worked on in the room you see here, and using these very implements, but Joseph Asher didn't split it right away. Preparations for the cutting had been underway for months, and crystal models had been made of the Cullinan in order to practice cleaving them apart to try to ascertain what would happen when the real stone was worked on. Eventually, it took four days, with the diamond in a specially made clamp, for Asher to do what you see here which was to make an incision of between a half and three quarters of an inch into it using a diamond saw. Finally, on the 10th of February, it was time to make the split. Asher inserted a blade of steel into the newly completed groove and struck it with a thick steel rod as you see here. It didn't work. The diamond was so strong that instead of it breaking, the steel knife broke instead. Asher tried again and this time the stone split in two. One part was 2,029.9 carats, the other was 1,068.8. After this second blow, Asher reportedly fainted from the stress of the whole operation, however this story has been disputed in the years since. Either way, his work was far from over. On the 14th of February, he split the larger of these two pieces into two again, making the three pieces in total which you see here. By the time the cleaving process was done, the original diamond had yielded nine large stones named Cullinan 1 to 9. There were also 96 smaller brilliants totaling 7.55 carats and 9.5 carats worth of unpolished fragments. When the stones weren't being worked on, they were held in this safe overnight. On the 2nd of March, Asher's team began the job of polishing the largest section from the original stone. This was the Cullinan One, or, as it would later become known, the Great Star of Africa. In view of its size, this 530.2 carat stone has 74 facets, instead of the 58 usually given to diamonds. It was ready on the 12th of September. The remaining eight stones were ready by November, but only because a team of three polishers had worked on them for 14 hours a day since the cleaving, using a cast iron disc onto which the diamonds were placed and which could revolve 2400 times per minute, though according to the Times this was slow to 2200 revolutions per minute in view of the size of the stones. Cullinan 1 and Cullinan 2 were presented to King Edward here at Windsor Castle on the 21st of November. In 1910, the larger of the two was placed into the sovereign scepter made in 1661 for Charles II. This is the biggest colourless cut diamond in the world, and the scepter had to be adapted and strengthened in order for the stone to fit into it and for it to be able to bear the star's weight. You can see the scepter here both before and after the Cullinan 1 had been added. Cullinan 2, also known as the second or lesser star of Africa, weighs 317.4 carats and was given 66 facets. It was placed into the Imperial State Crown in 1909, as shown here. Both are on view in the Jewel House in the Tower of London, where they can be seen today as long as they aren't in use by the monarch. Interestingly, the golden settings therein within the scepter and crown allow these two massive diamonds to be removed and brought together as a single, eye-wateringly expensive brooch. As payment for his work, Asher was allowed to keep Cullinan's three to nine, but these soon made their way back into the British royal family. Cullinan VI was bought by King Edward for his wife, Queen Alexandra, and put into a necklace. The other six stones were purchased in 1910 by the people of South Africa and given to Queen Mary, wife of King George V. 
Colonins 3 and 4, one a pair and the other a square shaped stone weighing 94.4 and 63.6 carats respectively, were initially placed into Mary's crown and are affectionately called Granny's Chips within the British royal family. They were soon put together to form a brooch, which is how you will still see them being worn today. Cullinan 5 is 18.8 .8 carats and is a heart shaped stone, which also became a brooch. Cullinan 7 is 8.8 .8 carats and Cullinan 8 is 6.8. They are now worn together as a necklace, though Cullinan 8 can also be worn as a brooch with Cullinan 6. Cullinan 9 at a mere 4.39 carats is the only one of the major stones to be set in a ring. All of them remain in the current monarch's private collection. As for the 96 smaller stones, they were sold to private clients by Asher. And that, history lovers, is the story of the biggest diamond ever found. If you enjoyed it, please remember to subscribe, give the video a like, and let me know in the comments below what your favourite famous diamond is. For more stories about incredible treasures, why not check out my videos on the Amber Room, the Darnley or Lennox Jewel, and the aforementioned Hope Diamond. Whatever you choose, please enjoy, and until next time, keep learning.